Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us this wonderful opportunity to worship you here. We know we'll be able to do this forever and ever because you deserve all the love and worship. And uh, we come to you with gratefulness, with our open heart and mind, and we pray that you will bless us for our little faith of trusting in you, believing in your word, and wanting to know more about you, about your plan for us, and about your schedule for the world. We, yes, we have worries, we have anxieties, we have cares. We know that we should not carry them alone, and we should leave it unloaded to you, for you are willing to carry our burden. Jesus already carried all of our sins on the cross, and anything that we still carry now is because that we have not repented and unloaded. So we pray that we do that now, and now make it clean between you and us, so that we have no barrier to holiness, to truth, to eternity. So illumine our heart and make us know the truth. And because of knowing the truth, and therefore knowing the evil of the world, and uh, may that make us clean it, yet not worry, because you are our king, and you are our general. You are fighting your battle, which is for us, but mostly it's for your name. And for that, you will always win. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We are doing the um, our study of the five pillars of Matthew. Today is 5.3, the fifth pillar, third sermon. Actually, it's the fourth because we have a zero. <laughs> uh, but uh, the title today is called The Preterist Option and the Judaic Zionism. And you might think, hmm, what is that? Well, we're going to explain it. Okay. <laughs> What's the preterist option? Okay. The verse for today is only one verse. Matthew 24, 34. Okay. Uh, remember, we did 31 verses in one session. <laughs> Then two verses, and now one verse. Can't be less than this. Right? Okay. Um, we're studying eschatology through the comparative study of three books, Daniel, Matthew, and Revelation. Daniel is about the, um, the visible kingdom of God, which is kind of the second stage of the physical kingdom. The first stage is fuzzy, second stage is clear. In both stages, the people of God had a rise, a fall, and the reconstruction. But the second time, when the reconstruction comes, the stage, the, the stage kind of lifted for a level. Okay? So you have a similar pattern and then lift it again. Okay? And after Christ, the whole kingdom's nature is spiritual kingdom. And then the first is the church age. There the kingdom is invisible. And then when Christ comes again, it will be both spiritual and visible. That's called the full kingdom. Okay? So now we are at the and we're yeah near the end of the spiritual kingdom and we're talking about the transition into the full kingdom okay and here are the five discourses of jesus in matthew we call them the five pillars the fifth one is called the olivet discourse and uh we gave you a uh, pattern united pattern of history and prophecy and now i printed out one that is more in detail okay so it can't be wrong. When the numbers are so right, it can't be wrong. Okay? Numbers don't lie. And now uh, let's review the structure of the Olivet Discourse, especially chapter 24 in Matthew. Okay? It has a layered questions and it has layered answers. Okay? And it has a chiastic structure. Okay? And uh, the first, the, all of the questions are in one verse. Matthew 24, 3. In verses 1 to 2, the disciples praised the beauty of the second temple. And Jesus said, yes, they are beautiful, but they will be um, torn down. Okay, So that's a prophecy. And after that, the disciples, four of them, Peter, John, 
Andrew and uh, James. They asked Jesus secretly. And uh, they asked two questions. And the second, they split into two. Thus, we actually have three questions. Okay. Question one is, Q1, when, when will all these things be? And apparently, all these things talk, is talking about the previously mentioned, the fall of the second temple. So the first question is, when will the fall of the second temple happen? That's number one, okay, Q1. And Q2 is what will be the sign when all these matters will take place? That means the other end time thing. So this is talking about the end time, okay? And uh, then the disciples said in the Hebrew Matthew, or uh, when will they begin? So this is one question. When is the beginning of the end time? What sign is for the beginning of the end time? One sign for the beginning of the end time. Okay. So this is Q two A. Okay. And then Q two B is when will uh, Q two B is when will be the end of the world and your coming together as one. Or in other words, what will be the signs? for the end of the world and your coming. Okay, that's one thing. Okay, uh, when translating to the Greek, the translators uh, took one meaning of the word, the Hebrew word olam, which could mean a age, time, or the world. They took the, the time, the age. So they translated when will be the uh, the what will be the signs for the end of the age? And in their understanding, that's the age of the church age. So this would became the second question. What's the sign for the end of the church age or aka the beginning of the end time? Okay. And uh, then the next question is what will be the sign of your coming? That means for the the last. Okay, so anyway, there are three questions. You can see them in both the Hebrew Matthew and the Greek Matthew. Okay, and uh, in uh, Mark and uh, Luke, uh, the st two second questions are fused into one because Mark came from an oral presentation, so he, 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 he kind of abbreviated it. Okay, and, uh, um, and the Luke came from uh, secondhand research, and he might have... Um, is from people's memory, okay, so that abbreviated, okay, but therefore the Hebrew Matthew is the first document, okay, it's the most reliable one. The Greek Matthew is a translation and the, uh, the structure is kept, although the wording are changed, okay. So these are the three questions, Q1, Q2A, Q2B, and Jesus answered them in the reverse order. First, he answered that the sign... The, the Q2B. What is the signs? What are the signs of the end of the world and Jesus' second coming? Well, the signs are the six signs of tribulation, which are the six seals in Revelation 6. So what are the six signs? Um, there, oh, there will be, um, that's the third question. The first answer, all right? The answer is that there will be false Christs, there will be wars, there will be famine, there will be plagues and earthquake, all causing mass death. There will be persecution, and it is associated to the abomination of desolation in Daniel 9, 27. And therefore we know it is in the middle of the seven-year tribulation, which is called the 70th week of Daniel. And the sixth is there will be heavenly disturbances. Stars will be falling, etc., etc. And the seventh thing is the second coming of Christ. Okay, so that was the answer, the first answer, which is for the third question. And uh, they are equivalent, we found out, to the uh, six seals, the first six signs, equivalent to the six seals in Revelation 6. Okay, so we know that Six signs, six seals, Revelation 6, 6, 6, 6. Well, maybe just happened. <laughs> so, the first seal is a white horse, which is the Antichrist. 
The second seal is a red horse, which is about wars. The third seal is black horse, economic crisis. Fourth seal is pale horse, which is massive death. And the fifth seal is persecution. Sixth seal is heavenly disturbance. And the seventh is the people refuse to face the coming Christ. Well, perfect alignment, right? So we know now what the uh, the Olivet Discourse is talking about. It's not talking about generally about church age. It's talking about the short seven-year period, the transition from the spiritual kingdom to the full kingdom, which is the 70th week of Daniel. It's actually the last of the Old Testament age. There are seven years left in the Old Testament age uh, to be applied in the future. <laughs> That's why the tribulation saints, people who believe in Jesus during the tribulation, they're not part of the church. The church is already gone. <laughs> they are part of the Old Testament saints. The tribulation saints, the Old Testament saints, they are on the same level. Okay, They don't have the permanent indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which is only for the church. Okay. And, uh, and the church existed only between the Pentecost of AD 33 and the rapture. Okay. Um, the seven years... Uh, since we know the six seals basically cover all of them, the, the seventh se uh, seal would be broken up to seven trumpets, and the seventh trumpets will be, uh, seventh trumpet will break up into seven bowls. So it's really just six seals, and the seventh seal will break up into the others. So it's seven seals cover the whole seven years. Okay, and uh, we know that they are in alignment with the with. Uh, the Olivet Discourse, and the Olivet Discourse said the fifth sign, which is persecution, is related to the abomination of desolation. Therefore, definitely this is talking about the 70th week of Daniel. Okay, It's not general tribulation of the church during the church age. No, this is specifically about those seven years, which has not happened yet. Okay, So now, by the structural alignment, we know what the Bible is talking about. You see, the problem for most people reading the Bible is not that they have not studied enough details. The problem is, is they see the trees, but don't see the forest. Therefore, they can apply the details, which took them a lot of time to, to think about it. And, and it's, you know, it's praiseable for, for the efforts. But if you apply to the wrong place, then it doesn't help, right? So we need to know we need to know the tree as well as the forest. Okay, the latter actually is more important because it gives you the framework. You need to have a bookshelf and then design your bookshelves for different kind of books in order for your books to be put in the right place. Right? So we're talking about the big framework now, and uh, uh, we have the images of the White horse, the false Christ, he has an arrow, no, he has a bow with no arrow, so he's the fake prince of peace. And then the white horse has a long sword, killing and killing, and the black horse, thin as a skeleton because of famine, and then that scale means rationing, okay? And then uh, death, the reaper, is here, and then following him is Hades, the gatherer. Okay, and then here the fifth persecution by the Antichrist. Okay, and uh, and then heavenly disturbances. Something is going to fall from heaven. Okay, here is talking about dragons, but it might be stars. Who knows? And then the seventh one is the second coming Christ on a white horse. So the first, the Antichrist was an imposter. Jesus is on a white horse. Those who raise horse know that your horse can go, can go to heaven. <laughs> We don't know about dogs. Hopefully so. <laughs> okay. The second question was, what will be the sign when all these matters will take place? Okay. Uh, and the part A is, when will they begin? So in other words, what is the sign for the beginning of the end time? Okay. And uh, uh, that is one sign. And the answer is, when the fig tree uh, again... Uh, produces leaves and fruits. The resurrection of the fig tree. 
and we know that fig tree is a symbol of Israel, right? So Jesus just cursed the fig tree and it died, right? That was a symbol. And then it's going to come back alive. We're not talking about the Jewish people. The Jewish people always exist, but the state of Israel did die and resurrect. So this is talking about the resurrection of the state of Israel. And it happened, right? Okay, in 1947. And now, today, we are going to focus on the first question. When will these things be? Okay, and what is these things? Well, these things is, by context, the fall of the second temple, which Jesus just predicted. Okay, so the first question was answered in the third answer. Okay, Jesus said, in the Hebrew Matthew, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things shall be uh, shall be done. Not being done, shall be done. Sorry. Um, correct. Because when I come back, I don't know what. Where should I? <laughs> okay. Uh, in the Greek Matthew, it says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. In Mark, it says, Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. In Luke, it said exactly the same. Okay, So, Jesus predicted that the second temple would fall within the time of one generation. The question is, how long is one generation? All right. So, let's now look at this chart for the big structure. Okay. The structure of... Uh, uh, of Matthew 24, 1 through 35, okay? The chiastic structure, Q&A, in the Olivet Discourse. Is it 24, 1 through 34, actually? I think you should correct it, 1 through 34. Make corrections, okay? It's verses 1 through 34. And also on that, the second Jewish revolt, change that to third. I'm going to explain why. On that 135, the year 135, that's the second Jewish revolt, that's the third. Okay, there's a second one in the middle, between the two. Okay, so I'm going to give you a clean one later. Okay, uh, <laughs> But uh, for now, you can see that there are three questions, and then there are three answers, okay, in the reverse order. Okay, The first question uh, is about when will these things, that's the fall of the second temple, when will this happen? Well, Jesus said one generation. I'm going to propose that the one generation is 40 years, because the first century Jews apparently believed so. Okay. They counted 40 years from 33 to 73, and in minus 7 years of tribulation, Jesus must come back in 66. Whatever way, wrapped to the church, whatever, they expected him to come back. He didn't. Therefore, those who believed him, in quotation mark, stopped believing in him. Well, because they never believed him as the Redeemer, they believed him as the King. The conqueror of the world, you know, the son of David, who will rule all the world on behalf of God and all the Jews. So he failed in that expectation, so he must be false, because their understanding could not be wrong, right? No, but that's how they understood, okay? So that's why in 66, they began the first Jewish revolt. It's called the Great Revolt, okay? And how long did that revolt last? Seven years. What happened in the middle of the seven years? The temple fell. <laughs> so that's the first generation, the first century's a Jew, Jewish understanding of the tribulation. It's called the preterist option. Okay, it's already happened before. Okay, and then we're going to deal with that later. This is the perceived tribulation. Uh, it's not the actual. The actual one is at the end. That's called the futurist option. Okay. And the second question is about what's the sign for the beginning of the end time? Well, that's the reappearing of the fig tree. Well, that's Israel. And that happened already in 1947. So in that sense, we are already living in the end time. Right? Because the beginning has already happened. Right? We're living in the end time. When will it end? At the second coming of Christ, of course. And uh, what's the next big event? The rapture of the church and the beginning of the building of the third temple, and then the abomination of desolation. Okay. So that's the big structure. Now, what is the one generation? Okay. If measuring the age of adulthood and the ability of reproduction, it is about 20 years. 
Wouldn't you say so? Okay, about 20 years. Okay. Uh, we can see biblical evidences from that point of view. We know that Cain's descendants had seven generations in 130 years before the birth of Seth. You can find that in Genesis 4 and 5. And therefore, the average, 130 divided by 7, you get about 18. And it's just like now. But at the 18 years, your body has matured. Not mentally, you know, you probably 25 and so become mature. But 18, your body is matured. If you get married at that time, around 17, 18, you can have children. And that's not considered abnormal. All right? So this is, if you count by the age of reproduction, about 20, less than, slightly less than 20, okay? And uh, during the 210 years that Israelites spent in Egypt, okay, uh, I adopt this short sojourn theory, okay? Because Apostle Paul said that the law was given 430 years after the promise, in Galatians 3.17, he said that. Okay, So Paul definitely believed that the promise which was given to Abraham when he came out of Ur, the promise is that he will receive a land, a nation, and a blessing. And the blessing includes twofold. One is that God will bless those who bless them and curse those who curse them. Number two is that all nations will be blessed by his seed. And we know this seed is Jesus Christ. Right? So, the promise was given to Abraham when he came out of Ur, or maybe entering the Canaan during that time. Okay? And uh, uh, the, uh, the law was given to Moses right after the Exodus. Right? They came out in the first month, the law was received in the third month, same year, 1446 BC. Okay? So, uh, if Paul believes so, I believe so. <laughs> So, the 430 years, therefore, counts from the exodus from Ur by Abram, not counting from Jacob entering Egypt. Because the promise wasn't given to Jacob, it was given to Abraham. Right? Okay. So, how long did Israel stay in Egypt? 430, counting from the exodus from Ur. 400 is when the seed of Abraham will sojourn. Well, he had his seed when he had Isaac. Okay, so from the birth of Isaac, exactly 400 years, okay, to the Exodus. And then uh, they lived in, in Canaan for a while because Abram was, what, 130 years after he came out of uh, uh, Ur when he had Isaac. And Isaac was 60 when he had the twin. And Jacob was 130 when he entered Egypt. You add them up, 30, 60, 130, you get 200. Uh, 20 years. And then you subtract it from 430, you got 210. That's the time Israel spent in Egypt. Okay, During those 210 years, uh, Exodus 6 said that the Levites had four generations. These people are lifelong students, and they marry late and have children late. Okay, So, uh, if you divide four, um, I mean, divide 210 by 4, you get 40, 52. Well, that's late, but it's possible, right? Uh, but if you count the generations in the genealogies, which most people will ignore, <laughs> in, uh, in First uh, Chronicles, you're going to find out the Judahites had a seven generations in the same time. And if you divide 210 by 7, you get average 30 years, which is normal, right? And then the Israelites, Israel, uh, Ephraim, Ephraimites, they had 10 generations. And if you divide 210 by 10, you get 21, which is also normal, right? So all of them are normal. Okay? It's just the Levites like to study. They married too late. But uh, the, the others, you know, the Ephraimites are spoiled kids. They can marry early. So <laughs> Judah's just about right. <laughs> so... Um, so you can see, if you measure by the age of reproduction, you can start from 20, you can go to 30, you can go to 50. Really, you know. okay. However, if you talk about the passing of the prime of life, okay, the time when you are good, you're working, okay, then it's 40 years. 
Because the first generation Israelites died in the desert in how many years? 40 years. Okay. The three kings, the only three kings for the united monarchy of Israel, when they are at the highest, okay, how long did each of them rule? All of them, 40 years. Okay, so that forms a pattern. Okay, 40 years is you measure a generation when you count the prime of life. Okay, and uh, if you measure by the life, uh, what do you call them, uh, lifespan, that could be even longer. I mean, you could go to 100 and whatever, you know. So, yeah, one generation can be counted a different way, but the middle way, counting by the prime, seems to be the way that the Jews understood it. Okay, because the first generation Jews definitely understood it that way. Okay. The Jews of the first century, including the Christians before AD 70, apparently understood Jesus' prophecy and acted accordingly. They believed that one generation equals 40 years, literally. Therefore, he should come back before AD 33 plus 40, that's AD 73, in 40 years. Okay? All these things should happen. The fall of temple should happen before 73. Okay? And all these things. And they counted as second coming of Christ in there. And they also believed that Jesus should have come back in a secondary way, such as to rapture the church, seven years ahead of that. In other words, 8073 minus 7, 8066. Okay? And thousands of Jews once believed that Jesus was the Messiah, and they were zealous for the law. Recorded in Acts 21.20, said James, the half-brother of Jesus and the bishop of Jerusalem. He said this to Paul in AD 54. Okay? So why would the Jews, these thousands of Jews, who believed in Jesus and zealous, be zealous in the law? Didn't Jesus, Jesus just place them under grace, therefore they're not under the law? Well, apparently they didn't understand it. They only believed that Jesus as the son of David, the king of Israel, the rightful ruler of the whole world, as the son of God. Okay, so that they believed, but they didn't believe in grace. So were these people spiritually saved, you think? Probably not, because they turned back to the old religion. Okay, If you are truly saved, one of the doctrines of the five points of Calvinism, the fifth one, is that the perseverance of saints. Right? If you're a true believer, you will never turn back to your B.C., before Christ, faith. Okay. And, uh, yeah, you may waver, but you will not end. So that is the call to perseverance of sin. These people did, that means they have never been truly saved. Once truly saved, always truly saved. It doesn't mean once you said the prayer of, you know, sinner's prayer, then you're saved. Not necessarily. You could say that just to please others. Okay? The once saved, always saved, must be applied by truly in both places. Once you are truly born again spiritually, God cannot unborn you. Okay, You are his children. You will grow up to be his heir. You cannot be unborn. Okay? Um, you could have untimely death because of sin, but that's not being unborn. You still died as a child of God. Okay? So, this uh, we're talking about um, the second kind of soil. Not the third sauce kind. Remember, four kinds of soils. The first kind is the roadside. They the gospel comes in here, goes out there. They do not, not care. They do not care. The second kind are those who have signs of life. They sprout, but they have no root. Therefore, no eternal life. The third kind, they do have root. Root. They do have eternal life, but the thorns crowded it out. Uh, you know, absorbed all the uh, the nutrition, so they produce no fruit. So these people cannot prove to the world that they are believers. I mean, we can't tell is he saved or not. He says he is. We take him as one, but he doesn't show. So he might be saved. He might not. Okay. And there are so many of these people, unfortunately, these days. 
But the third kind is saved, the second kind is not. Okay? And the fourth, of course, those who are proven believers. You have truly transformed character, and you serve God, and you prove it, and you persevere to the end, right? And then that's proven believers. So, the, these people, I believe, are the second kind of the soil. They are not truly saved. They just appear to have signs of life with no true eternal life. Okay. And uh, uh, when Jesus failed to show up in AD 36, 66, the Jews who believed in Jesus, with quotation mark, only for his Davidic kingship, not spiritual redemption, went back to the old faith and followed the radical teachers, the zealots. Okay. The Zealots began the first Jewish revolt against Rome in AD 66. And how long did it last? Seven years, till 73. Okay. And three New Testament books were written uh, all during circa 67 through 68 against the Zealots as false teachers. Okay. First of all, I believe it was, well, the Bible says it was Jude who wrote the... <laughs> Well, the book of Jude is the second shortest of the Bible, of the New Testament. I think Third John is, but this is the shortest. Uh, uh, but Jude is one of the shortest books. He is either a half-brother of Jesus, okay, uh, or he is Judas, a.k.a. Simon the Zealot, the bishop of Jerusalem after James. Okay. We found a document written by Hippolytus. A church father who lived around AD 200, okay? a bishop of Rome, in other words, a pope. Okay? And he wrote 12 apostles and 70 apostles, two short documents. It was lost for many years, but found later, and now it's collected in the church fathers. And uh, I read it and accidentally, <laughs> of course, nothing is accidental, right? But I found it accidentally, but now it's become an integral part of my New Testament theology and and. and Historiography, historiography. Okay. and uh, it mentioned that one of the twelve apostles, Simon the Zealot, his his original name was Judas, okay, and he was the son of Cleopas, okay, and Cleopas happens to be the one of the seventy apostles of Jesus, and he was also a bishop of Jerusalem, and another source, a second century Jewish source said that Cleopas was the brother of Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus. In other words, Cleopas was a son of David, okay? And uh, he um, was apparently an older gentleman, so he was apparently the first bishop of Jerusalem. When he died, James, the brother of Jesus, the son of Joseph, a son of David, became the second bishop of Jerusalem. And after James was killed by the Jewish leadership, pushing, pushed down from the temple and fell down, uh, badly injured and then stoned. Okay. When James uh, died, I think in 62, uh, maybe, and Simon became the third bishop of Jerusalem. And Simon uh, was the bishop of Jerusalem till he was 120 years which will be well into the second century. Okay? But if this Simon, according to Hippolytus, who is Simon the Zealot, if he is, according to him, the son of Cleopas, who is also a son of David, right? Therefore, the first three bishops of Jerusalem were all sons of David. What does that tell you about the Jewish faith in Christ in the first and second century? It's about the dynasty. Okay? It's not about spiritual redemption. It's about the dynasty. Okay? So, um, <clears throat> Jude wrote a letter. Jude was on site. He's in Jerusalem. He knew the zealots, how bad they are. So he wrote a letter denouncing them as false teachers, as false prophets. And I think he wrote it to Peter, the first apostle, reporting the situation, asking, how do I, how should I regard them? Peter wrote back Second Peter. And saying, yes, you're right. They are false teachers. They are going to hell. And these are actually the signs of false teachers. He gave the standard of judging what is a false teacher. Second Peter is a very important book. Okay? Second Peter also affirmed Paul, Paul's writing as scripture. 
Okay, so that's also very important. Okay, and Paul, on the other hand, he wrote when he was in prison. He knew that he was going to die. Uh, he knew that he was appointed as the apostle to the Gentiles. However, he always had a heart to reach to his brothers, physical brothers, the Jews. Okay, so now hearing that the Jews had started a rebellion against Rome, therefore thinking too much about the dynasty and too little about spiritual redemption, he wrote the book of Hebrews. Okay, in Hebrew language. Okay. And the Luke translated into Greek, and the Greek version is in our standard New Testament. We found the Hebrew version; it tells the same thing. Okay, so um, the uh, in Hebrews, Paul wrote against them. He wrote to you, okay, and the you apparently are born again true Jewish believers of Jesus. Them are the false believers of Jesus okay, among the Jews. Okay, so Jesus, uh, Paul said, "You do not be like them. They have crucified Jesus again on the cross, and for them there is no more redemption. But you don't be like them." So he didn't say that you can lose your salvation. He just said those people never truly believe. They are not saved from the beginning, and now they are showing their true color. Okay? But you, true believers among the Jewish people, don't follow them. Don't join the rebellion. Withdraw. Which they did. Okay? And because of that, the Christian Jews were shunned as traitors by the rest of the Jews. Okay. So, the, uh, Rome under Nero sent Vespasian and his son Titus to suppress the Jewish rebellion in AD 66. Vespasian became the Caesar in 69 to 79, after Nero's death in 68, and three short-lived emperors, Galba, Otto, and uh, Vitellius. Uh, that year was called the year of four emperors. <laughs> And uh, Titus later succeeded Vespasian as emperor in 79 and 81. He was considered the best emperor, but he ruled only two years because Rome suffered many disasters. Three of them. One of them was a, volcanus, a volcano eruption okay, and um, Pompeii. Pom so, um, and he died early, and then his brother, who was a bad guy, Domitian, became the emperor, and he ruled all the way till 96. He was the one who jailed John, uh, the apostle of Patmos. Okay. So, Josephus, the famous Jewish historian, he was once a Jewish general during the rebellion. He was captured by Vespasian, but predicted that he would become the ruler of the world. When it became true, Josephus was regarded as a prophet in Rome. He got a pension, he got a villa, and he wrote three books. <laughs> the Antiquities of the Jews, the Jewish Wars, and uh, uh, anti uh, against uh, Apian, three books. And they are very important for the first century uh, eyewitness against, uh, on these events. Okay. So Josephus apparently, in his book, in the Antiquity of the Jews, uh, when he talked about Jesus, he said Jesus was a righteous man, and uh, he was the Messiah. He actually said that, that he was the Messiah. He might have believed him as kind of a Jewish believer in the dynastic sense, you know, and uh, and then he did, of course, disbelieved him. Okay, and then uh, he said a lot of good words about uh, James, the brother of Jesus, saying how righteous he was, how unjust when he was put, you know, killed, and uh, he said a lot of good words about John the Baptist. So he was sympathetic. To the Christians side, but he wasn't a born again Christian. Okay, and then uh, since Jesus wasn't was kind of proven to be not the true Messiah, then he thought the the prophecy still must be true, but it must be interpreted differently. So rather than a Jew will rise up overthrowing Rome, therefore rule of the world. It can be realized in another way. A emperor of Rome who rules over the world will arise from Judea. And therefore, the current general who is going to conquer Judea, and he will become the Caesar, 
and rule the world over the world. You see? This is how Josephus thought, I think. Okay, it makes sense. Okay, so he made the prediction when he was captured as a prisoner. He said, yeah, I, I, you captured me, you won. Okay, I lost. But I prophesy that you will become the ruler of the world. You will become Caesar. Wow, really? <laughs> At first, Vespasian didn't believe him, jailed him, but treated him well, you know, tried not to kill him. But when the, the other emperors all died, and then they found out, hey, uh, I can become emperor. And then some of the Roman army declared him emperor against his will. He had to accept it. Okay? Then he thought, hmm, this is not what I wanted, but this is what the gods wanted. Okay? And therefore, Josephus must be a prophet. Okay? So that's why he released Josephus. And rather than opening the lock on the chain, his son Titus suggested that they should use a hammer or sledge, whatever, to cut through the chain. Because that means the person was wrongly jailed. Okay, innocent. Okay, so they cut through the chain and then, of course, opened it. And then later he was given a really good life. Okay, so that was Josephus. Interesting background, right? And Titus uh, succeeded in suppressing the major rebellion in AD 70 by burning the temple. He didn't want to burn the temple, but he found out that while he tried to send the Roman soldiers up, they all got killed. The Jews at that time got crazy because they believed that if we can defeat the Romans and we can survive after 73, we will be the Messiah. And we will be the sons of God who will rule over the world. That's what the Zealots believe. So they fought like crazy mad dogs. Okay? And uh, they don't care about life at all. And um, so Titus found out, I want to preserve my soldiers' lives. So rather than sending them up to be killed, he agreed with the soldier's suggestion, burning it. Okay? That's the only way of defeating the Jews. And um, after that, he conquered all of the cities except one fortress, Masada. Masada was a fortress built on top of a hill, okay, flat top hill, built by Herod. There's a lot of uh, water and food stored in, uh, stored in there. And the, the zealots who took control of it, they actually raided a city called Nain, N-A-I-N, Nain, where Jesus resurrected a, a son of a widow, Amen. At a gate of Nain. Okay. They raided that city, killed all of the men there who are Jews, and took their food and brought on Masada. They thought they could last all the way after 73. Then they will be the ruler of the world. Well, in 73, the Romans built a ramp up, of course, with Jewish slaves' lives. Built them up, and then the Jews up there will kill the Jews down there. And, but none the way. They built it up all the way. Once they reached the gate, they burned the gate and then stormed the second gate. When they got in, they found out everybody was dead. Okay. Well, everybody except a couple of women who hid themselves. What happened is that the, the leader ordered every man to kill their family. And then they ordered a few men, they took lots, a few men would kill the others. And then they made agreement they will kill each other. I think 10 of them, they killed everybody else and then they killed each other. So when the Romans Romans entered there, everybody's dead. When they found out a couple of women who told them the story. Okay. So that's Masada, and that's the end of the Great Revolt. Okay. And uh, according to Josephus, um, millions of Jews were killed and then enslaved later. And uh, they're still allowed to live there. But after the next rebellion, they were driven out. Okay, so here are the images of Vespasian and Titus. They were considered good emperors in Rome. Okay, they kind of brought the high time of Rome. Vespasian was the one who built the Colosseum, which is still there. Okay. Um, yeah, Titus was an unfortunate. He's a good, good man. But he did a work against God's temple. I think God allowed evil to happen to him. And he suffered many disasters and died after only ruling for two years. So, 
And then here is the preterist option. The Great Revolt, which is the first Jewish revolt in AD 66 or 73, lasted for seven years, exactly as long as the prophesied 70th week of Daniel, in Daniel 9, 24 to 27. And in the middle of the seven years, the second temple was burned in AD 70, similar to the prophesied appearance of the abomination of desolation, interpreted as Titus taking the Roman standard into Jerusalem. Okay, you know, the Roman standard has an eagle on it. It's regarded as an idol. When he conquered Jerusalem, taking it in is considered as abomination of desolation. And uh, uh, thus it became an option for interpreting the 70th week of Daniel, uh, the tribulation, to place it in the first century. Okay, this is called the preterist option. One of the four schools in the interpretation of Daniel and Revelation. Okay. Two of the four schools uh, regard the 70th week of Daniel literally as seven years. One of them is the pre-mentioned preterist school. Okay. It believed that this already happened in the first century, 66 or 73. This option today is adopted by most of the liberal scholars who disregard Bible prophecy because they don't believe anybody can predict the future. Okay? And they don't believe in the existence of God anyway. So that's the liberals, okay? Mostly adopt the preterist. Unfortunately, some evangelicals have adopted this too, and the number is increasing. Okay? One of them is pretty famous. Have any of you heard about the Bible Answer Man Hour on radio? Okay? It used to be the Dr. Walter Martin. And uh, he founded the Christian Research Institute in California, and he was a great defender of Christian faith. Okay, he, he knows a lot about cults and all cults and those things, and he just defeats them on debate. It never, he always wins debate. Okay, so Walter Martin was great, except his end time, he's a millennial. That's not a big issue. Okay, his successor was his assistant at that time, called Hank Hanegraaff. Okay. He took over the institute and the program. He was a great defender of faith, too, and a great in apologetics. But his position on the end time, as it turned out, I don't know if it changed, probably changed. But as it turned out, I found out that he became a preterist. Okay. And once he made that public, his radio just plummeted. <laughs> a few people started listening, because most evangelicals don't accept that. Okay. So anyway, preterist is mostly evangelical, mostly liberal, and some evangelical. Okay, and uh, the futurist school is most evangelicals. Okay, so we are premillennial and we're dispensationalists. We are the futurists. This is yet to happen in the future. Okay, two other schools regard this tribulation as figuratively and metaphorically. The historicist school believe that the church suffers many specific tribulations during the church age. They can name which pope persecuted the true Christians. Okay? Uh, and uh, the ideal, idealist school believe that the church generally uh, is both the kingdom of God now and the sufferer of persecution. So we are in a battle between good and evil. So sometimes the church has good times, sometimes a bad time. That's the idealist, all the way until the second coming. Okay? So today, the idealist school is the amillennialist, or the reformed school. And uh, the historical uh, position was adopted by most of the Reformation, uh, the Reformers. Okay? And then the post-millennialists, that's the founders of this country, they're post-millennialists. They believe that we Christians will build a kingdom of God, which is millennium. And after we succeeded, Jesus will come back and say, good job. Okay, that's called post-millennialists. Okay? So they believe in progressivism. We Christians will rule the world using state power and we'll progress. We will ban liquor first, then cigar later, and so on. But they failed at, at liquor. <laughs> so the, now the progressivism has no Christians. It's all liberal and the communists. Okay. So uh, that's the situation. Okay. Personally, I believe in the futurist school because it fits the Bible and the history better. Okay. And uh, the Judaic understanding. How do the Jews after Jesus understand this? 
After rejecting Jesus' offer of spiritual kingdom, the Jews became obsessed on taking Jesus' promise of the Messiah as a military conqueror of the world. Literally, the only school of Judaism that survived A.D. 70 was Phariseeism. The Sadducees, Zealots, the Zealots, the Essenes, the Herodians all perished. The Christians withdrew from Jerusalem before its fall and were shunned as traitors. The rabbis, right now they are the 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 leaders of the Phariseeism, right? The only branch of Judaism that survived. The rabbis, which made Phariseeism called Rabbinical Judaism, which is the majority of the Jews today. Judaism today. The rabbis re recorded eerie similarities between the fall of the Second Temple. And uh, the、uh, the fall of two temples. Okay, the the fall the first temple actually fell in 586 B.C. But it was thought by the rabbis as 421 B.C. And we'll explain it later in the next page. Okay,、um, they recorded that both temples fell on the ninth day of Ab, which is the fifth month. Okay, and、uh, actually it was tenth day as recorded by Jeremiah and Josephus. But somehow the Jews said the ninth day. Well, one day difference, no big deal. So on every Ab ninth, they would fast. Okay, and uh, both uh, temples fell on the on the Sabbath day, on Saturday. And both had the first order of the twenty-four orders of priests on duty. Now David divided priests on twenty-four orders. They take turns; each serve a week. And on Saturday at noon, they change order. They change shift, okay? And I、uh, calculated between the two of them. I see. Do they re really? I found the the days difference. Okay, you have to use astronomical calculation to find the new moons in each 586 BC and 870. Okay, and you find the first、uh, month, first day, and then、um, you find out the fifth month, the tenth day, and then you calculate the number of days in between. And you want to see if they divide seven. They do. Well, that cannot happen by coincidence, right? So this record is accurate. Okay. And by the way, Luke's recorded. Luke recorded that John the Baptist's father belonged to the eighth order of the twenty-four orders, and he served in the major festival. Uh, shortly before, of course, the conception of John the Baptist, right? Okay, and、uh, because we know Jesus was born four or five, he cannot be later than four because Herod died in four, right? So Jesus was born probably four or five, and John had to be five or six, all right? So we look around there, we found out the eighth. If the uh, the uh, first order served <clears throat> in this fall of the two two temples. The eighth order served in the fall of six B.C. So John the Baptist was conceived in the fall around September six B.C., and Jesus was conceived six months later in the spring of five B.C. Ninth month later, he was born in December of five B.C. Okay, and the first day of The Hanukkah in that year happened to be December the twenty fourth, Christmas Eve, and Jesus was both the new temple and the light of the world. So that's the meaning of Hanukkah, the candle of light, festival of light, dedicating the a a, a new temple. Okay, see, so everything fits wonderful. Okay. Science, Bible, history, Jewish, Gentile, Roman,、um, and barbarians—you know—they all fail. They all fit. Okay, chronology is a wonderful thing. Enhances your faith. Okay, so now we know that the school,、uh, the, the rabbis—they recorded these, and、uh, also both year are after a sabbatical year, a year after sabbatical year. This is actually true only for eighty seventy. Now for five eighty six. But however, in the way that they calculated, it will fit. Let me tell you. The rabbis recalculated the prophecy from AD seventy. The seventy weeks of Daniel is seventy times seven equals fourteen four hundred ninety years, right? And they 
uh, regard the 490 years as including the 70 years of exile and 420 years of restoration. They counted back from AD 70, thus the fall of the first temple was placed in 490 minus 70 plus 1 equals 421 BC. And the return from exile was placed in 421 minus 70 equals 351 BC. Remember, both are fictitious and ideological dates, not historical dates. Okay. However, because AD 70 was a year after sabbatical year, therefore 421 BC, which was 490 years before, divisible by 7, it was also a year after sabbatical year. You see? Okay. So right now, all of their records have been confirmed, either scientifically or by their scheme. <clears throat> they counted from... Now, the 69 weeks of Daniel are 69 times 7 equals 483 years. That's when the Messiah should appear, right? So they counted from uh, 483. No, see, they counted 483 years. From 421 BC and landed in AD 132. You see, 483 minus 421 plus 1 is 132. <clears throat> so, in AD 132, <clears throat> Simon Bar Kokhba, which means a son of a star, uh, son of the star, the star of David, <laughs> you know, and declared himself as the Nazi, which means the prince, the ruler of Judea, and started the Bar Kokhba revolt. He's not even a son of David, but he says he's a son of a star. Okay. Rabbi Akiba, <clears throat> the leader of the Pharisees of that time, endorsed Bar Kokhba as the true Messiah. Akiba was killed by the Romans for holding on to the faith. By the Jewish record, Akiba's back was combed with iron hot, with burning red hot uh, iron uh, comb. They combed his back with that and said, do you still believe Simon Bar Kokhba as the Messiah? He says, I'll believe it even if I die for it. And he died for it. What a tragedy for having such a strong faith, but in the wrong Messiah. Yeah. Okay. So the Bar Kokhba revolt is called the third Jewish revolt, not the second against Rome. Historically, the second Jewish revolt happened in AD 115 to 117. It is called the Quito's War or the Rebellion in Diaspora. Uh, it happened not in Judea, but in Cyprus, Egypt, and Mesopotamia. So, Bar Kokhba revolt was the second that happened in Judea. Okay. And uh, Hadrian, who was Caesar during 117 to 138, he suppressed the Bar Kokhba revolt, and he did more. <coughs> He renamed the land as Palestine, which means the land of the Philistines, even though the Philistine people already disappeared from history. Okay. And he drove the Jews uh, off the land of Palestine. Okay. He drove them off, depopulated them. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> um, he renamed Jerusalem as Aelia Capitolina after himself. And he removed all Jewish and Christian landmarks and made pagan buildings upon them. Well, because he was so accurate, it helped 200 years later when Helena, the mother of Constantine, who was a Christian, went to Jerusalem and she just ordered the Roman soldiers to tear down the pagan uh, landmarks and dig down. And he found all of the Christian and Jewish sites. So, the Jews called Simon Bar Kokhba. From then on, Simon bar Kosiba, the son of a fly. Okay, And they stopped making rebellions against Rome, but false messiahs continued to appear. There were about 50 after Jesus. Okay, I read this from a book written by a Jew I bought in Jerusalem. Okay, Jerry Rabble wrote a book called 50 Jewish Messiahs. And here are their lists. Okay. Zabo counted these as messiahs before Jesus. Zerubbabel, uh, the first who led the first return from Babylon in 5, 
34 BC, and Judah, the teacher of righteousness, who founded the sect of Essenes in circa 100 BC. Okay, and then there are other, many others, self-claimed the Messiah after Jesus. Judas in AD 44, he was mentioned in the Bible, and Simon Bar Kokhba, 132 to 135, Moses of Crete, 440, the Syrian Messiah, 643. Serenas, 720, Abu Isa, 750, Yedan of Hamadan, 800, Mushka in the 800s, the Lion's Messiah, uh, or Leon Messiah, um, 1060, uh, Ibn Ayer, 110, Moshe Aldaro, 1120, David Elroy, 1120 to 1147, the Yemenite Messiah, 1192, Abraham Abu Lafia, 1240 to 1291, Nisim ben Abrahim, prophet of Avila, 1295, Samuel Abu Lafia, 1320 to 1361, Moses Botaro, um, 1393, Joseph Carroll, 1488 to 1575, Miss, the Messiah of Bahan, 1495, Asher Lameline, uh, 1500, David Juveni, 1523, Shlomo Moko, 1525, Isaac Luria, 1534 to 1572. He introduced Kabbalah into the mainstream of Judaism. The Lurian interpretation of Kabbalah is currently held as the orthodox interpretation of Kabbalah. Kabbalah already existed in the 2nd century AD among the Jews. I have their writings. However, it was not mainstream. After Luria, it became the mainstream. Okay. By the way, Kabbalah is believing that God is both good and evil. At one hand, pointing up, doing good, one hand pointing down, doing evil. So that actually is pantheism, is not theism. Okay. And uh, um, then Hayim Vital, 1542 uh, to 1620. Then Ludovico Diaz, the Messiah of uh, Subo, uh, in 1540. Then Sabatai Zevi, 1626 to 1676. He declared that he is the Messiah in the year of 1666. What a good day. Yeah. And he is the one who proposed that you must sin in order to become holy. Because you cannot try to become holy and arrive. He recognized that. But he says, you can do the other way. You can try to sin and do the other most, most egregious and evil sin. But by doing that, you push God to the uttermost and he has to make you holy. Holy. So, yes. From then on, the Sabatine Frankish people who are in the leadership of many places, they made doing the most evil sin the necessity in order to become holy. Okay. So, disturbing, isn't it? And then, Nehemiah Cohen, who confronted Sabbatai in 1666, Suleiman Jamal, who died in 1666, Abraham Miguel uh, uh, Cardozo uh, in 1626 to 1706, uh, Mordecai um, Ben Haimov uh, Eisenfeld. In 1630 to 1706, Yeh uh, Yehuda Leib Prosnitz in 17, 1670 to 1730, and uh, Yehoshua Herschel Torev in 1633 to 1700, Hayim Ben Shlomo in 1655 to 1716, Nehemiah Ben Hayum in 1650 to 1690, and Jacob Philosoph Querido in 15, 1650 to 1690, and the Baruka, Barukia uh, Rusa, who died in 1720. And then Berekiah Philosoph, who died in 1740, and Moshe Hayim Luzato, who, uh, who lived in 1707 to 1747, then Jacob Frank, 1726 to 1791. He initiated the World Revolution Movement. He made allies with two forces. One is called the House of Rothschild, 
who were used called the Meyer. Um, you know, they were bankers in Germany. And later they made a red shield for their house, which in German is Rothschild, means red Rothschild in English. Okay. And uh, they became so powerful after the War of Waterloo, they ruled over England and then the rest of the world. Right now, all nations' central banks are under the control of the Rothschilds, except three countries, Cuba, Iran, and North Korea. Okay. And, uh, and then another ally was Adam Weisskopf, who founded an organization in 1776. Okay, on May 1st, that's why May 1st is the, the day for the workers' movement, okay? Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the organization's name is the Illuminati, the Illumined Ones. Uh, for them, they believe that Lucifer is the light and uh, Jehovah is darkness. So they always say light will defeat darkness, but they mean just the opposite of what you think. Okay. And they took control of Freemasons, and they became the kingmaker of the world. Okay. And the United States was founded by our founding fathers, who were apparently Christians, but many of them were illumined also. In our great seal, it has this the, the, the pyramid. On top of it, there's a one all-knowing eye. It's called the capstone. Okay. And uh, um, that is Lucifer. And, and the word saying in Latin on there, not in English, so that you don't understand, it says, the announcement of the coming of the new world order. That's what this country was founded for, to bringing in the new world order, which means worldwide communism. Um, oh, the, that's why Frank, uh, Jacob Frank was credited for initiating the Jacobins who began the French Revolution. Okay. And afterwards, he, his daughter, Eva Frank, okay, is called the lady because she sleeps with everybody important in Europe. Okay. And, uh, and then Baal Shem Tov, and then Nachman Braslov, then Israel uh, of Rushin, that's in now into the 1790s, 1850s, and the Itzhak uh, Azik of Komar Komarno of 1806 to 1874, and Sh uh, Shekben uh, Shalim Kuhayo uh, the first, uh, 1821 to 1865, uh, Shek Kuhayo the second, who appears in 1867, then Yusuf Abdallah in 1895, then Manahem uh, Mendo Schneerson. Uh, some spared with eight. 1902 in 1994. When he died, I think he's in New York, Jews in the whole world came to mourn him. They thought, we already had the Messiah. Why did he die? Okay. I went to Europe and uh, I went to Israel and I saw a, uh, what do you call them, on the streets, the signs, and it says, the Messiah is here. Menachem, Rabbi Schneider. Schneider. So, those are the 50 messiahs, okay, written by a Jew in the book that I bought in Israel. So, it can't be false, right? So, what do we learn? The kingdom of heaven is a spiritual kingdom of God. Now, the Jews, as long as they reject the spiritual kingdom of God by Jesus, they will always try to push for a physical kingdom of the Jews of the world. You don't like to hear about it. People are going to be sensitive saying it, but that's the fact. And because of this, they are always suspected and then sometimes persecuted if they're found to do something like this. This is an unavoidable fact. All of them. Okay. And however, though the participants use evil forces, it is the will of God for the reestablishment of the state of Israel in AD 1947. Jesus prophesied that. Okay. And then all of the proposals trying to apply the one generation from the reestablishment of, is, uh, of Israel to calculate the time of the rapture are erroneous. I mean, all of the proposals are erroneous. 
Okay. Some said 40 years, so they counted 1987. Some say, oh, maybe Abraham's age, 100, while well, they have another age. All of them are erroneous because the one generation was meant by Jesus for the first century for the fall of the second temple in AD 70. And that has already been fulfilled. Don't try to move it to another stage. Okay. So, a little disturbed? Yeah, you should be. Um, but God gave us the anchor, and he cleared our eyes. We can see the truth, and we don't have to be waved by, by the external forces. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the wonderful prophecy by your Son, the Lord of the world, Jesus Christ, that he prophesied everything that is to come. It will be lab established in time and the elab uh, elaborated in the book of Revelation, as we will study. Thank you for this very important verse, and I pray that you let us realize that we should not do the baseless ending, uh, guessing game of the second coming date. We should only work based on your word and the historical facts. We pray that our understanding of the Jewish people will be factual, and yet with truth and love. We know you love them, you want to save them, and we pray that you your will be done. But for all those who are doing evil, we pray that you protect us from that with love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. May the love of God and the mercy of Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you, with me, with us from now till eternity. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.